Okay, so uh, hi everyone. Uh, well, uh, welcome and uh, thanks for joining. So today we have the pleasure of uh, hosting uh, Professor Aris Karastergiu. So um, Aris started his uh, career uh, in Thessaloniki where he did his undergrad in physics. Um, then after that, uh, he did uh, he went for an Erasmus fellowship and then he stayed for a PhD at the Max Planck Institute uh, for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. Uh, so after obtaining his PhD, he spent some time in uh, Sydney as a postdoc and then as a Marie Curie fellow in Grenoble, uh, working with IRAM. And then since 2007, uh, he's at the University of uh, Oxford, uh, Department of uh, Astrophysics. So Aris uh, generally works on uh, a lot of things. So he likes to work on astrophysical problems uh, related to pulsars and young pulsars uh, in particular, uh, but he also likes to build telescopes. So um, he, uh, you know, um, he's the PI of the Oxford group for developing uh, uh, pulsars and transient uh, search uh, software for the SKA. And he also does a lot of interesting things with uh, Mirkat, and that's what he's going to talk to us about today. So, Aris, thanks again for accepting our invitation, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's it's a pleasure to to talk to you today. And as we were saying earlier, it, it would have been so nice to actually visit you in person. I, I hope we get the chance to do that um, when when things normalize a little bit. But anyway, um, so I wanted to talk to you today about um, a, a project we've got running on the Meerkat telescope. Um, and I'll tell you some details about the Meerkat telescope later. The, the lion in the picture is just to signify that the telescope itself is located in, in Southern Africa, in South Africa. Um, and um, wh while talking to you about this project, I'll sort of take the opportunity to to talk about things I, I am interested in with respect to, um, to pulsars. So I'm going to show a bunch of slides and um, there's contributions in there from, from collaborators on, on, um, in, these, in these various papers. Um, I've listed a few of them here. So by means of an introduction, let me say, uh, okay, this works now. So let me say that, um, you know, I, I imagine that most of you have a basic understanding of what, what a pulsar is, but this is kind of the, the list of ingredients that you need to make a pulsar. Um, so pulsars are neutron stars. Um, they typically have masses that are between 1.2 and two times the mass of the sun. Um, they are extremely compact. So they have the diameter of uh, a medium sized town, so about 10, 20 kilometers or so. And so um, th that, that means that the density is extremely, extremely large. You can, the, 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 the way to describe this to the public is to say that you have one mountain's worth of mass in a teaspoon. Uh, actually in the, in the um, um, interiors of neutron stars, it, we, we, it, um, we think we understand that the density exceeds um, nuclear density. So um, <clears throat> they have superfluid interiors, so there's no viscosity. Um, and they're surrounded by a solid, a solid crust. Um, based on how we understand them to, to be configured and to, um, to emit, uh, we think we infer super strong surface magnetic fields of somewhere between 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 14 Gauss. And around um, these neutron stars, there is a co-rotating charged magnetosphere. So the misalignment between the magnetic axis and the rotation axis, as you see on the left there, um, causes um, charged particles to be ripped out of the surface of the crust. and um, through various processes that we only partially understand, um, the, the, the magnetosphere itself is filled with um, a, stream, a, a, pl a, pl a plasma, 
which um, due to the rotation of the star, as you can imagine, some of these field lines cannot, magnetic field lines cannot, cannot close because um, they reach the so-called radius of the light cylinder where the, um, the, the velocity becomes uh, equal to the speed of light. And therefore that leaves a, a region around the, um, the north and south polar um, po po magnetic poles where, the, where particles will, um, will be accelerated and stream outward. Um, so there's a high energy stream in plasma, which is probably the source of um, the emissions that I'm going to be talking about today. And so we see pulsars emit in radio, in optical, X-ray, gamma rays, and of course, um, in, the, in the last um, few decades and ramping up, we see gravitational wave radiation from pulsars. So that's kind of an introduction. And here um, you see two versions of the same, the same diagram. It's, it's a so-called period period derivative or PP dot diagram for, for the pulsar population, which um, basically uh, is, is used by astronomers to sort of make sense of the population. Um, so um, what, what we see here is, um, let me see if I can annotate while we, so we see a population of pulsars up here, which is the so-called um, young, young population. It's um, pulsars are thought to be born somewhere in this corner up here. Um, and um, then the other significant population in this diagram is this population down here, which is the very old millisecond pulsars where the very fast rotational periods arise from accretion um, from, from binary companions. So there's some other interesting sort of smaller groups um, in, this, in this diagram. Um, there's a population of uh, neutron star and neutron star binary systems, which sits somewhere, somewhere in this region. And there's a population of um, sources with very strong inferred surface magnetic fields that, that we call magnetars, which generally sit at the top corner up there. So uh, there are several questions that arise from this diagram, as, as in uh, wh where, where are pulsars born? How do they move around? How do they age? How does one population relate to the other? Um, do the normal, do some of the normal pulsars sort of mig migrate into becoming magnetars at some point? Or um, and, and of course, these these questions have a broader <clears throat> context um, because we think we understand um, pulsars as being products of core collapse supernova explosions. <clears throat> But um, uh, therefore, we have to match the rates of these uh, of these events to the uh, to the numbers and, and uh, of, of sources and their ages and so on. So it's interesting to understand how things move around in the, in this diagram. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is that, um, as you can see, there are some lines drawn on there on the diagram on the left in particular, which is the um, is the default diagram one gets when, when one downloads the uh, software from the ATNF Pulsar catalog, you can see some lines of constant magnetic field and constant characteristic age. And I'll come back to where these, what these things, these things mean. Um, in my opinion, both of these sets of lines is not particularly, um, particularly informative because they rely on um, the assumption that uh, the reason pulsars are slowing down, so the, reasons why, the reason why pulsars uh, move generally to the right in this diagram um, is uh, due to um, magnetic dipole breaking. So the fact that there, there's a gigantic, very strong magnet that's misaligned to the rotation axis and, um, and the very low frequency um, electromagnetic radiation there is, is slowing down the pulsar. But um, in fact, there's, there's good evidence to suggest that that's not the, uh, not necessarily the, the key mechanism 
that's responsible for spin down the pulsars and therefore both the characteristic ages and the surface magnetic fields um, may not be accurate. On the contrary, on the diagram on the on the right, there's an additional set set of lines that you can see here, and these are um, lines of constant spin down energy. So this is the energy that's sort of available to the pulsar due to the fact that it's spinning down to convert into various forms of um, uh, maybe observable radiation. So um, I think that that is a a physical parameter that is um, in some ways more reliable if, I, if one wants to understand this population. And I'll, I'll make some, some comments about that as we go on. Um, sorry about the transition there. Um, so these are, these are the, the definitions of, um, you know, where those, what, what those, those, those quantities mean. So the surface magnetic field, um, I in this case is the, the moment of inertia and this alpha, is the um, angle between the uh, magnetic axis and the rotation axis. As you can imagine, the, the geometry of these stars is quite important in, in, in interpreting and, and modeling what we see. PP dot are the, are the observables. And um, these two equations both rely on the fact that, um, that we interpret all the spin down to be from the, the gigantic dipole slowing the pulsar down. Um, so typically, uh, in order to understand how things move on the PP dot diagram, um, pulsar astronomers uh, tend to define this so-called breaking index, which is just um, the frequency times the second derivative of the frequency over the first derivative square. And for various um, for various breaking mechanisms, uh, that that breaking index has a, a value that can be theoretically uh, calculated and and compared to to the observations. The problem with comparing to the observations is that in order to measure this new double dot here, um, one needs to have quite a large change in new dot over a long period of time. So that's generally only possible for, for young pulsars rather than millisecond pulsars. So the, the program I'm going to talk to you about is related to monitoring the young pulsar population. So the, the, the bulk of that PP dot diagram that I, that I mentioned earlier. I just want to give some, some motivation because um, you know young, young pulsars are very interesting, at least <laughs> to people like me, but they, um, they hardly ever make um, you know, the cover of nature or the, the nine o'clock news because they're sort of, they've been there for the last 50 years. We, we were expanding their population over the last 50 years. And um, uh, we sort of gradually, gradually coming to terms with what, what you know, the pulsar uh, phenomenon actually, actually represents. So despite, despite 50 years or, 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 or more now, 54, whatever, um, there, there are still some very basic open questions like, you know, uh, the birth properties. What, what spin period are they, are they, are pulsars born with, and how do they, how do they evolve? And, you know, what, what is the observational evidence for the uh, configuration of this magnetic dipolar field that I, that I told you about earlier? And of course, to understand the basics uh, or to interpret the basics of, of our observations, we, we in many cases first want to understand the geometry so what where in the pulsar is the emission coming from mm, are we seeing a filled beam or a, or a patchy beam um, and you know that's crucial because we need to understand how much of the sky each pulsar illuminates so that's that's a so-called beaming fraction um, and that is to say you know how many pulsars from the galactic population for example can we actually see? So the way the way this works is that the beam comes out of the magnetic pole. The magnetic pole is misaligned with respect to the rotation axis. So there's a there's a lighthouse effect. That's the common analogy. And when the beam um, goes past the line of sight of a of our telescope, then we can observe a, that that particular source. But it depends on how wide you know how how wide an angle this beam sweeps on the sky. 
as to whether we can see it or not. And of course, you know, the, the big question there is the birth rate and how does it relate to, their, to the um, precursors of these objects? Um, there are other questions relating to um, how the interiors of the neutron star interact with the magnetosphere. So um, the pulsars are generally very stable rotators, but occasionally they undergo um, so some events where the rotational stability is disrupted. Um, so instead of arriving, in, instead of the next pulse arriving at a very precise predicted moment, it arrives slightly earlier or later. Um, and so um, that we can infer um, various interesting processes that are happening in their interiors from, from these timing irregularities. And so there are, there are programs both at the Royal Bank and at Parks and um, gradually at, at more telescopes, low far, I guess, by now, um, of, of monitoring these sorts of pulses for long periods of time in order to derive parameters like the break index that I, that I mentioned a minute ago um, and, and start understanding how the various sources move in the piggy dot diagram. So millisecond pulsars, that, that population on the bottom left corner of the PV dot diagram, are the most rotationally stable. Um, but, but young pulsars, um, there's more. There's more young pulsars. So there's an order of magnitude more, at least. Uh, and in this population, there are some interesting, let's say, let's call them corner cases. So pulsars that have particular characteristics that are that make them um, ideal candidates to study a specific phenomenon. Um, they have a la larger spin down rate. And so um, that allows um, us to measure the spin down rate on, on shorter, on shorter timescales and therefore um, understand, find, you know, discover pulsars that change their spin down rate, for example. Um, and, uh, and also it allows for measurements of the break index, as I said before. And also, um, if you notice those lines of characteristic age that I, that I put on the PV dot diagram earlier, potentially they span over a billion years of age. So um, within this uh, group of young pulsars, there are, there are pulsars of, of many, many different ages. Um, so, here is a, a, an explanation of what different braking mechanisms would, would do um, in terms of the, you know, the movement of a particular source on the PV dot diagram. So imagine a source born up in the corner where the three lines uh, originate from. Um, if the source is being, is being slowed down by the emission of uh, a particle wind, then we would have the expectation that the breaking index would be one and the pulsars would be sort of moving upwards towards that, that corner of where the magnetars are. Um, the canonical pulsar is breaking uh, by magnetic dipole emission and that has an, uh, a, a value of the breaking index equals three. So that's a little bit steeper than that line of 2.7 that I've drawn there. And if there's a significant quadrupole moment um, of the magnet, then then there's a um, there's there's an expectation that pulsars will be breaking um, at a much steeper rate, so so closer to the n equals six line that I've that I've drawn there. In terms of the corner case corner cases that I that I mentioned earlier, um, I've I've I thought for me at least three three particular examples um, are, are very interesting. Um, I'll talk about two of them in a little bit more detail. So there's a, the, the original discovery of a pulsar that switches its spin down rate, its new dot, um, while at the same time um, starting and stopping its radio emission. Um, a pulsar that is in a binary system that's processing um, due to GR, where the line of sight doesn't have a single cut through the emission beam, but due to precession, we are able to, to map um, the, the beam and, uh, and therefore, um, you know, in this unique case, see, see what it actually looks like. And um, another pulsar that's actually one of my favorites 
0738 minus 4042, where um, the state switching um, is actually also tied to another magnetospheric effect um, of orthogonally polarized components in the in the emission that also come and go and change the, the spin down rate. So the state switcher, the original state switcher, here's the here's the the plot that was in the in the science paper I think in 2006. Um, basically, what 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 you see here is um, the change of the spin frequency in the in the top panel, the change of the spin frequency versus time, and the key thing to, to understand is that the slope here is steeper than the slope here. Every time the pulsar is on, where you actually have measurements, so here, 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 and here, the slope uh, is, is steeper than the, the line that connects um, the phases where the pulsar is off. So in other words, uh, the, there, is, there seems to be uh, a torque that's associated with um, the pulsar in its on state that is absent um, when the when the pulsar is off, and this was really nicely interpreted as uh, as the torque induced by the uh, by the by the charged particles in the in the pulsar magnetosphere, and in fact even derived from these sorts of measurements that the the charge the magnetosphere is actually charged in in a way that's expected. Um, this is 0738 minus 4042. Um, in this case, it's not as dramatic as the whole radio pulse appearing and disappearing, but um, what happened between 2004 and 2006 was that um, a, in the leading edge of the profile, just to guide your eye, in 2004, the profile looked like that, and then between then and 2006, it gradually grew a pretty large component that, that exists uh, still up to um, today. Uh, interestingly, it's, it's completely trivial to simulate how the polarization uh, of, this, of this pulsar behaves um, just by adding uh, an orthogonally polarized mode. So let me just explain that a little bit. So what you're seeing here is this is the total power. So this is the, the beam of the pulsar is sweeping past the telescope. And you see already that the beam has quite a complex profile. It's not just a, a Gaussian, it's a collection of multiple components. So the beam is not uniformly lit. Um, this red line here is the linearly polarized component. And this blue line here is the circularly polarized component. So pulsars are typically quite highly linearly polarized, and um, in terms of astrophysical uh, you know, comparisons to other astrophysical sources, quite highly circularly polarized as well. Um, this panel up here shows the position angle, the position angle of the um, of the linear polarization, and what you see is that at two rotational phases, at two, um, you know. Um, parts of the, of the rotational cycle of the pulsar here and here, there is a, a 90 degree jump. So the polarization jumps between um, one track and a track that's 90 degrees offset. And we think the under, we understand this, um, this is due to the, um, the, the properties of the, of the plasma in the magnetosphere sort of generate two modes of propagation of the radio emission that are orthogonally polarized. And depending on which of the two is, is strongest, um, their incoherent sum at, at the telescope dictates which of the two polarizations you, you actually see. And so the, the interesting thing with respect to the simulations here is that if you add a Gaussian component, I guess somewhere around here with, um, with polarization that is orthogonal to uh, the polarization at that pulse phase, you can completely, um, you can very nicely sort of replicate the observations with simulations. Um, I'll ignore that. Just give me a sec, sorry, this is... Uh... Okay. 
the joys of uh, online presenting. So um, here's, here's another pulsar, 1830 minus 1059, where a similar thing happens. So actually, I, I should have said for 0738, when that change happens to the profile, there is a, a change of order 15% to the, the spin down rate that happens quite suddenly. Um, so here's another pulsar, 1830 minus 1059, where um, on the, in, the top, in the top panel, you see basically a, a, a difference map. So this, um, this, this shows you the difference between an observed pulse profile and, and a template. Uh, and you see that, that you know the differences are sort of fluctuating between positive and negative with time. So this is time, and you can I hope see quite clearly that there is a, a correlation, a correlated change in the spin down rate um, that, that corresponds to those changes in the profile. So the the pulsar is spinning down in a way that is correlated to the um, emission properties. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> this will keep running forever if I don't do something about it. So let me just pause for two seconds, okay? And I will I will come back to you. Sure, no worries. Uh, go ahead, Aris. Taking it off the hook. Okay, so um, so in 2017, um, Simon Johnston and I proposed a, a model whereby these kinds of episodic events that that change the spin down rate, um, they they. Um, we used them to try and see if we can populate the entire PP dot diagram by um, just randomly sampling a distribution of, of breaking indices. Um, and these are what, what we've shown here is, is um, various tracks in red of pulsars that are all born somewhere up here with the with the properties of the of the crab pulsar. Uh, uh, a very a known young young pulsar, and over time, um, they they experience these kinds of episodic events where uh, the spin down rate changes and um, the breaking index is is chosen from a distribution. But actually, two things are happening here. One is the breaking index is is changing in this way, and the other thing is that the uh, angle between the magnetic axis and the rotation axis are, is 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 becoming smaller, so pulsars are, are, are aligning with time, and there's, there's quite a bit of evidence in the observations for that as well. I stood up in uh, in at the, uh, a meeting in Manchester uh, four years ago and urged people to publish breaking indices that are not that do not conform to the canonical ideas. So uh, at the moment, people publish uh, values of you know, 2.7 and 3.5 and 6 and 5 and 1 and so on. But nobody publishes a, a, a break index of 40 or 400 or minus 6 or, you know, various numbers like that. Uh, but in fact, um, I, I'm, I'm very happy to see in the literature in the last years that people are now publishing break indices that are very different to the expectations uh, that you would have from from um, the magnetic dipole breaking or wind or, or uh, the uh, magnetic quadrupole. Um, and uh, that, that's giving some, some more you know, weight to the, the, the idea that the, the, the main mechanism may not be the magnetic dipole breaking. This is all, uh, yeah, okay. So, so doing that, um, one, one can derive a simulated population with some relatively sound assumptions, I think, and it doesn't, it doesn't look too bad compared to the observed population. So the third, the third uh, motivation for our, for our survey with the Meerkat telescope is to, is to provide a, a, a catalog of parameters for, for young pulsars, at least, that um, 
that derive from a single survey with a single processing pipeline and uh, you know a hom homogeneous treatment of a, of a very large data set. The Pulsar catalog, as it as it exists at the moment, is a uh, is, uh, is, is, is put together using values from multiple inhomogeneous surveys. And it's often quite hard to use that to um, derive uh, properties that are, um, you know, that, that can be compared between different um, subsets of the population. Actually, on the right hand side here, this is a this is a PP dot diagram um, in a different form. And I, I, I really like this um, compared to the Scatter plot I showed you at the beginning, especially now that there are, uh, you know, so many pul over three thousand pulsars or so, um, because it shows you where the where the dense where the densest you know um, group sits, and so you know if if pulsars are aging somehow in this direction, one may be um, tempted to think that m most of them. Will end up sitting, you know, somewhere here because, uh, in characteristic age terms, the the, uh, you know, this po this population spans, <laughs> you know, ten million years or a hundred million years, whereas you know, every step backwards in this direction spans a much shorter period of time. But no, most pulsars are sitting somewhere here, so that's really quite an interesting thing to, to see. So we want to build a, a homogeneous catalog. And last but not least, um, we've got Meerkat, which is, um, I hope you've all heard of it. It's, uh, it's an amazing telescope. It's a fantastically sensitive telescope in the Southern Hemisphere. It's, um, it's really opened up the possibilities to observe a larger population in reasonable amounts of time with enough signal to noise um, to do this sort of work. Um, it's an interferometer that's a precursor to um, the first phase of the SKA. It's in the Karoo in, in South Africa, and it's made up of 64 dishes that look like that. Each of them is 13.97 meters, and most of this work is done in um, at a frequency range of 856 to 1712 megahertz. So it's got a, a, a bandwidth to center frequency ratio of, um, of uh, one to two. Uh, the receiver temperature is 18. 18 Kelvin, um, which is very low, and that's uh, you know that 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 means the overall um, equip system equivalent flux density is is much uh, lower than the Parkes telescope, which uh, is of course the the main pulsar instrument in the southern hemisphere. So this program is is set to create um, some legacy data sets that will become publicly available. The first one is to observe over 1,000 pulsars with at least 1,000 rotations per pulsar in full polarization. Um, so I should say that you know pulsar profile, the profiles that I'm showing you here are the averages of many individual rotations. And typically, you need a few thousand rotations from a few hundred, let's say, to a few thousand rotations per pulsar, depending on the pulsar, to get uh, a profile that doesn't um, change dramatically with, with time. So the leg this legacy data set will, ha will have data from, um, actually from 1,200 plus pulsars have been observed already. And each of them will have single pulse data. So you can look at the re rich phenomenology in the, in the individual pulses. And, I'm showing you actually data from the pulse I was showing you earlier, 0738 minus 4042, so you can get a, a feel for the for the for the signal to noise. This is a super bright pulsar, but but signal to noise here is is incredibly high. Um, just just quickly, this is this is what the pulse profile looks like as a function of observing frequency. So you can see pulsars generally get wider at low frequencies than the narrow narrow now we're a pulse at the high frequency end. And this is a, a plot of um, short integrations uh, over time. So you can see here the, the variability um, in, the short, um, in the short duration averages. Um, whereas when you add all these, uh, all these uh, sub integrations up, you get a stable average profile. Uh, the second legacy data set 
consists of monthly monitoring of over 500 sources, um, initially for 12 months, but we're looking to expand this beyond. So this is done uh, with an integration time that guarantees a signal to noise that allows us to detect whether the profile is changing at the 10% level. So um, we, we wrote a paper explaining how we can um, translate the observed modulation properties of pulsars into, a, into an observing time that, that sort of guarantees that we can see um, changes in the profile, so significant changes, let's say, in the profile at the 10% 10, 10 level to, to look for um, um, correlations between rotation and, um, and um, uh, radio emission. So here's another, another um, pulsar, another very bright pulsar, and the same, the same plots, um, the profile versus frequency and versus time. And you know, here's here's an example of another um, few few plots of of um, you know of the kind of data that we're that we're getting. And you you can see in in these plots, you can see the very rich set of um, phenomena that we observe on on even short timescales with the sensitivity of this telescope. So let me just go through some of the first results. Well, we published the, I, th I think we're up to uh, paper seven now of the of the program. The first paper was um, just a, a description of what we plan to do and how we plan to do it. And the second paper was um, explaining how we computed the integration times and how we can split the Meerkat telescope into two subarrays and maximize the efficiency uh, for a program that, that wants to target such a large number of sources. And so just briefly on, on the results here, we, we pointed this telescope at, at uh, a pulsar in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is kind of a twin, a very similar pulsar to the Crab pulsar. Uh, and it's called 0540. Uh, and we observed this, this pulsar uh, emits occasional extremely bright giant pulses. Um, Giant pulses are not necessarily best defined by virtue of their brightness, but by the fact that they follow a power law distribution, as you can see on the on the bottom left there. So their, their fluxes follow a very clear power law distribution. We were able to, to measure that, and that places some constraints on the possible um, emission mechanisms. Um, the results we got there were, were um, not this similar to things that people have observed in the past, but with the sensitivity of Meerkat, we can see uh, many more giant pulses um, from this source, so we can we can verify these sorts of things. But perhaps the more surprising thing was that we found a bunch of um, giant pulses from 0540 that are um, uh, we call them band limited, so they are, they are narrow band. So so here you see the the where the the pulse versus frequency and time, and you see them. All the flux um, arises in, in a very small um, window of frequencies. That's that's quite a tricky thing to explain from a physical point of view because the, the emission processes in pulsars, um, you know, it's 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 difficult to to for them not to be broadband, let's say. Um, and these kinds of features are typically associated with uh, with propagation effects, scintillation, and, and things like that. Perhaps the more interesting comparison is between this and what we see for, for lots of um, fast radio bursts that are now known to be of extragalactic origin, uh, where we see a similar similar effect, as, I, as I'm trying to show, at least in this, in this plot in the middle here, uh, where the emission is also um, often band limited. So this raises some questions about whether giant pulses could be the origins of FRBs. We published the paper on the polarization of young young pulsars. So um, th these are these are pulsars that are, that have high E dot values and are sitting somewhere uh, around here. The argument goes something like this: We see that high E dot pulsars have high linear polarization, and we know that the degree of linear polarization is set by the presence and strength of orthogonal modes in the magnetosphere. So is it is it reasonable to consider that um, young pulsars emit at high emission heights 
therefore um, their emission is less affected by propagation through the through the magnetosphere. And in fact, in, in this paper, we we um, um, we again confirm the fact that that uh, young pulsars are very highly linearly um, polarized. Um, you know, the, all these lines of sight to all these all these pulsars also probe uh, lines of sight through the through the galaxy, and so we can measure things like uh, interstellar scattering. Don't forget the pulsars are point sources, so they are nicely they, they are scattered and they suffer scintillation and so on. So the the figure on the left hand side here, um, you know, it looks like a it looks like a simulation, like a computer model, but in fact this is this is the data. It's um, it's perfectly described by a narrow Gaussian convo con convolved with a with an exponential tail, which is what you would exactly expect by um, having a, a scattering screen that isotropically scatters um, around all, all possible directions. So Lucy Oswald published a paper where she measured the, the spectral index of the um, scattering time scale and showed that if you do this very carefully, you, you actually do get a mean um, spectral index around um, minus four, which is, which is, what, is it, what, what is expected for these isotropic scattering screens. Um, so we are very, you know, we talked about geometry and the shape of the, of the, of the beam and so on. So we, um, we are able to do some very basic measurements like measure the width of the pulse profile for a large, for a large population. And here, the interesting thing is the following. If you assume that all pulsars are, are emitting from a fixed height, and um, this, this height um, corresponds to a region that is um, defined by the open magnetic field lines above the uh, magnetic pole, uh, if the emission height is constant, then you would expect the pulse width to be proportional to one half uh, sorry, to one over the square root of the pulse period um, by virtue of the, the magnetic, the, the, the dipolar field. Um, of course, this is distorted by the, by the geometry. You can imagine if you are, uh, if this is a pulsar beam and your line of sight is cutting it right at the edge, you would observe a much narrower width perhaps than if you're cutting it in the middle. Um, but but on average, you would expect um, the, this relationship to hold. Um, there's been a bunch of papers in the last um, decade or so that have shown that the width is proportional to the period to the minus, minus 0 0.3, which is not exactly 0 0.5. And in this, in this paper, so this is the, this is the power law of um, spectral index of minus 0 0.3. And in this paper, we show that uh, if you actually plot these uh, these measurements as a density plot and um, fit a power law, um, basically like you're fitting the position angle to an ellipse, uh, then then you would get this fit here, which actually is is about 0.55. It's much closer to what you would expect. So there there may still be good observational evidence that the emission heights for most of these normal pulsars are, are constant um, with, with period. And also for the, for the, for the same reasons that, um, that you know, are evident on this little cartoon that I drew here, you can use the pulse width to, have, to get, give you some idea of um, the actual geometry uh, of the star. And this is what, this is what the plot on the, on the right is trying to show you that the pulsars um, Towards the right of the of this population, are um, have a have a smaller inclination angle, so they're more blue than the pulsars to the left. Um, so, the last paper in the series that that we have up to now is uh, just a, a, a small study of the pulsars that we're observing in the Magellanic clouds, and here, you know, measuring the uh, the polarization, we can actually derive a rotation measure, um, as shown in the in the um, circles on this plot, and we can put it on a on a on a 
an, an image and compare it to other rotation measures measured using uh, background point sources. Um, so, you know, that these, are, these are just examples of the things that one can do with such a large population of, of data. The plot on the, on the left shows the, the scattering, the temporal scattering properties of the same pulsars versus their, their dispersion measure. So that, that's just a sample of what we've done so far. Um, I guess it's fair to say that the key, key results out of this survey are yet to come. We are preparing a census, a census paper that with the catalog paper, basically, that, that has all the uh, polarimetric profiles, all the measurements of dispersion measures, rotation measures, um, all, um, degrees of polarization, position angles, anything we can say about the geometry. So we're, we're preparing that based on the, uh, the legacy data set one that I talked about earlier. And we're preparing a single pulse phenomenology paper that, that describes everything we see in the in the million single pulses that we've collected from this from this sample so that's another big paper that's going to come out hopefully in the in the next uh, little while um, but there's a thousand things that one can do with this and you know we've already noticed that um, some mode switching pulsars have interesting polarization switches that have repercussions on the the way um, polarization is, is is generated and the way modes behave uh, we can do further with the stellar medium, and in fact, right now we're working on scintillation measurements, uh, which give us the presence of, of scintillation screens in the galaxy. So um, let's say inhomogeneous distributions of um, free electrons that are, that are sitting, that we know there are, there are finite screens between us and, and, any, and any pulsar, and, and these, um, these data give us an opportunity to, to exploit that to understand of the instellar medium. And also uh, we have um, the possibility to, to um, um, use our data in conjunction with other wavelengths like X-ray observations, for example, that give us other observable parameters on the, on the age, for example, with, with temperature measurements, such that we can connect the radio data and the X-ray data and, and say something about um, the way pulsars or some pulsars are evolving on the on the PV dot diagram, and of course there's lo there's lots and lots of more things that one can do, and and as I said, the data will be will be available online for for people to use if they want to. So I'll just finish uh, by by saying that I think I think this this project is is nice because it's giving us it's we're learning a lot of things about how to um, observe and process a large population. Um, with a telescope like like this, and I think you know, as the population of, of known pulsars grows with new discoveries with the SKA, we need to be able to monitor a very large population to find pulsars that contain answers to the to the key problems. So, in particular, exploring the the, the time variability of pulsars on various time scales, um, I think is is key in uh, giving us some understanding of how they evolve with 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 time. And understanding the pulsar population, physics of radio emission, um, you know, the, the radio emission is the, is the carrier of, that we have to, to, to interpret each star and the population as a whole. So we need to be able to understand the geometry, the, the, the origins, the characteristics and polarization and so on. And of course, um, as we increase the population, the population will, will increase at least tenfold with the SKA. There will be more and more of these um, individual, you know, corner cases that show um, particular um, characteristics that are, that are easier to, to, to explain without having to solve multiple problems at the same time. So that's that's all I had to say. I hope um, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, so thanks a lot, Laris, for this. Uh, extremely uh, interesting overview of the of the project so uh, we do have some time for questions so other questions for aris please raise your hand or speak up so i see a hand raised by nikki lafis so nick please go ahead uh hi ari this is uh, nikki lafis 
No. Uh, but good to see you even on the screen after so many <laughs> years. Yes. Um, uh, thank you for a very, uh, in, very interesting and, and thorough uh, uh, review of what we know about pulsars and also the discussion of what we don't know about pulsars, which are also quite a few. Uh, so it's an exciting field to work in. As an expert on pulsars, I would like uh, your uh, opinion on the following matter. How comfortable do you feel with the people who study magnetars uh, in using the PP dot formula to infer the magnetic field of magnetars? So I, I am probably um, not, well, I'll give you my opinion on this, but my opinion is probably at odds with the majority of the community. Um, I am not comfortable at all is my is my answer and uh, perhaps there have been some um, there have been there's evidence of some, there's some direct evidence for the magnitude of the magnetic fields through cyclotron lines um, there is a there is some of course there's the underlying issue of where the energy for um, the outbursts of magnetars come, comes from, and there the magnetic field is a convenient um, reservoir. But in terms of the <clears throat> dot diagram and the uh, breaking, magnetic dipole breaking and so on, I think that um, it's, it's, yeah, I think that we need to move, move beyond what, what, we have been saying for the last few decades. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't use the PP dot diagram to say that a particular pulsar has this strength of surface magnetic field. Well, and I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't do it for magnetars, and I wouldn't do it for for young pulsars or any anything really. Um, uh, uh, I am glad to hear this because I share your opinion. Um, I do not feel comfortable either with the ease with which they use just blindly this formula. Um, just because this formula gives 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 Gauss does not mean anything. Because in order to make fun of it, when I give talks about it, I say, uh, consider an ice skater on an ice ring who is rotating at a period P and someone measures his or her P dot. Can you infer a magnetic field from that? <laughs> and, and clearly no, of course, I'm making fun of it because uh, it's friction that determines the P dot and not magnetic dipole radiation. Yeah. So um, again, I see inconsistencies. You said it before that um, the cyclotron line that they measured, they interpreted as uh, coming from a multiple magnetic field while they do not use multiple fields for the breaking, they use dipole. So yeah. a, a very inconsistent treatment and I'm not happy about it, but as you said, uh, the entire community does not listen. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't be uh, as negative as that, as, as pessimistic. I think, I think one needs to start somewhere and for, you know, for the textbooks on pulsars that were written 20 years ago or 30 years ago, I think that was a, a useful place to start. But I think um, it's time to, to move on. And I, th I think there are more and more sort of voices that are pointing out these, these issues, especially with the discovery of, um, you know, with the observation of, of phenomena that, that significantly change the um, P dot, let's say, uh, when, with a single event that is completely unrelated, clearly to, to magnetic dipole breaking. So, um, yeah, I think there's 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 ways forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. So I uh, see Andreas has a question. Uh, Andreas Zeza, so please go ahead, Andrea. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Aris. This is uh, this was a very very interesting uh, talk and very exciting results are coming out from uh, Mercat. That's really nice. 
Uh, I have a rather basic question. Um, I was wondering, you may have mentioned the answer, but, uh, but I may have missed it. Uh, I was wondering, what are the physical mechanisms that change the braking index? Uh, is it uh, similar to what is causing the glitches or is something else? Well, um, so, the, so there are two things there. I mean, you can, you can think of a mechanism exactly like what Nick said, right? You can think of a mechanism. So let's say, let's say that the spin down is caused by magnetic dipole radiation, then you can work out what the braking index is. Or let's say that it's caused by um, a particle wind, then you can work out what the what the um, breaking index is. Um, so there's there's the theoretical values, and then you can actually go and measure the breaking index as you know um, new new dot new double dot times new dot squared. Uh, sorry, over new dot squared, and and there you then have to start thinking what could cause this. So um, currently. Yes, I, I would say glitches are, I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to call glitches a physical uh, process because, you know, glitches are, again, a phenomenon that needs to be explained by another bit of physics, which is related to, um, you know, vo superfluid vortices and pinning and unpinning and things like that, most likely. Um, it's, I, I, I would imagine it's quite hard to derive breaking indices um, from specific glitch models. Um, you would have to think about how glitches evolve with time and what, how the physical processes of glitches evolve with time. But definitely, I think glitches are, are, are one candidate. Another candidate might be externally induced torques. You know, so for example, the, uh, the presence of uh, <clears throat> all back disks and material around the pulsar that may occasionally, um, <laughs> you know, do exotic things like hit the pulsar or be, be melted by the pulsar magnetosphere and contribute um, an additional um, reservoir of plasma that, that may actually torque the, the pulsar a little bit. Uh, the, you know, there are, there are, there are possibilities that I think we're just becoming aware of right now that just go beyond this, uh, the, these these standard explanations of winds, dipole, dipole magnetic field, and um, you know quadrupole magnetic fields, and so on. I, I hope this 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 addresses your question. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So my understanding is that the bottom line is that we don't really know, but there are some ideas. That's right. That's that's okay. a good summary. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Andrea. Uh, are there uh, any other questions? Um, so, Vincent, uh, please go ahead. Yes, hi, hello. Uh, first, thank you for the very nice um, talk. Amazing and, and very clear. Um, I'm, I'm mostly interested in, in uh, um, well, I, I'm mostly studying galactic magnetic field. And so I, I would be very interested to know more about the, um, the catalog of pulsars that, that can be used to infer magnetic field. Yeah. So you, you, you mentioned that um, <clears throat> you're working on, on, on the catalog and yet that you will make it public at some point. Yeah. Uh, could, you, could you be more uh, specific? And also, um, uh, what, what, what is the um, sky area that is covered by the catalog? Do you sample more? the galactic disk or do you finally have a good pure source at um, higher galactic latitudes or I don't know. Yeah, so we have, we have, yeah, th th thanks for that. Um, yeah, we, we have good sampling of both low and high galactic latitudes. Um, I mean, we're, we're observing all pulsars that we can see um, uh, lower than the deck of, I don't know, plus 15 or some, something like that. So, so we, we you know, we have quite a, we have a very good coverage in that respect. Um, we have um, many hundreds of newly measured rotation measures, <clears throat> which we are currently, I, I actually forgot to include that in the, in, the, in the slides, but we are currently putting together uh, a paper where we show how these fit into the, you know, galactic magnetic field models based on rotation measures. So, that should be that should be out in the next 
few months, uh, he says optimistically. Um, the, the measurements are, are already there, and I think I think that paper will sort of come out uh, at the same time as the census paper. So um, by let's say the the spring, you know, by March next year, I hope we'll have both of those papers out. Um, please feel free to to send me an email um, by that time if that hasn't happened and you you want some some more information. I, I think I think we'll be in a good place by then. Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, thank you, Aris. We'll all look forward to that. Um, other questions for Aris? Uh, so I, I, I have a question about the, uh, the, the future of Mirkat and the future of this uh, project with Mirkat. Uh, so I was actually wondering what is the current uh, timeline for the Mirkat extension and are there any plans to continue this project when uh, Mirkat or to repeat this project uh, when Mirkat uh, gets extended? Um, so uh, I guess what you're asking is the Mirkat extension. I'm not talking about the SKA uh, extension. Yeah. I'm talking <clears throat> about uh, more uh, uh, yeah. the one that is already uh, planned for the uh, yeah, so, so Meerkat will acquire a, a bunch of new dishes, mostly at longer baselines, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the, uh, the answer is, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm the co-PI of this project, and um, Meerkat, Meerkat time allocation is, is very precious, and it's being done very carefully. And so I don't, I don't know what will happen um, once our allocated hours have passed and there's, there's an extension to make it. I can tell you that our priority for the uh, next phase of this project is to use, um, first of all, the UHF receiver. So, so the one centered at 850 megahertz, where we have the ability to study um, some of the ISM phenomena better and the the band is cl cleaner in terms of RFI and then possibly also um, try to use some of the S band so the 2.3 gigahertz <coughs> um, receivers um, to, to to at least do some sort of census if if not a monitoring campaign I think the part the main point here is that you know, we, we are producing these results from this program and we want these results to also motivate um, you know, the continuation of these programs, whatever the state of the art of the telescope is going forward. So whether it's the extension of Meerkat, the, the SK, SK1 mid, um, I think we need to have some, some continuing effort that, that aims at understanding the population of pulsars. And I think this is the way to do it. So we, we are, um, you know, we're gaining a lot of experience in that respect so that we can we can argue this this course, but we don't have specific plans yet for, for the Meerkat extension. Thank you. Okay. Any final question for the speaker? Three? Two, uh, one. No, if not, then uh, let's uh, thank Aris again. Uh, thanks again for accepting our invitation, Aris. And uh, let's try to do this in person. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I'm certainly looking forward to that. Yeah. So thank you all for joining. And uh, bye. Uh, see you next time. Bye bye.